I can't believe your husband proposed to you on the set of Pet Cemetery. <laughs> yeah. What the fuck? Well, it wasn't on the set. We went away <laughs> for the weekend to the beautiful Acadia National Park. Okay, so it wasn't Maine. on the set of Pet no, Cemetery. No, no, not you got on Fred Gwynn no, there going, well, No, my husband's married. so romantic. He he had, you know, bought he bought a ring, you know, and he was looking for a time and a place. And so we went away for the weekend up to the national park. And we never actually he wanted to like propose to me at sunrise which is the first place that the sun rises in America is at Acadia National Park, Cadillac Mountain. What? It's the easternmost park in America. Didn't know that. And um, so he had this whole huge plan, but like all plans, <laughs> well, it didn't come to fruition because he just couldn't bear to wait that long. So he actually proposed to me like f- four hours after we'd left, you know, Ellsworth, Maine and, uh, that's where they they shot Pet Cemeteries in Ellsworth, which. Did you, by the way, I know I'm jumping around, but I'm thinking of Mike Flanagan and Midnight Club, and which is available on Netflix. Did you, how many times did you audition for that or he just offered you the part? He just offered me the part. See? I mean, that really He's... picked me up out of a really, I mean, there's this, yeah, I wasn't in a funk, but I just didn't think anything like that was going to happen. Um so you just got a call one day or your agent said, hey, Mike Flanagan wants to talk to you? Well, yeah, my manager called and said, uh, there's a casting director casting director up here in Vancouver who's contacted me. Um, Mike Flanagan has a new show and they, they would like to have you read this part. And uh, I said, great, you know, send it over. I'm thinking it's like a one episode thing and really excited about it. But then I got the sides and the opening speech of this character. It was like one speech and you kind of get to know Dr. Georgina Stanton. Basically, um, her son has died of cancer and she's opened up a hospice for kids with cancer who are terminal. And this is like, it was just her opening speech where she's welcoming a new patient into this hospice. And I am... I get the, I'm in, I'm like literally on the 101 freeway getting off at Las Virginas Canyon Road. And I decided to pull into the gas station just to read the sides because I had to do the audition the next morning on my iPhone. And I just wanted to like go over it in my head while I'm driving my long little windy road over Malibu Canyon. So I sit there and I'm reading the sides and I just burst into tears like, because her story is not my exact story, but I lost my son to brain cancer five years ago. And so this whole this whole idea that she was this woman who'd lost her son and had decided to open a hospice for kids with cancer was something that just really struck a nerve in me. And so after I, you know, cried for several minutes, oh. then I just started like memorizing the lines like, okay, I'm going to just get this in me. And so over my windy road... And then the next morning I had to get up and do an audition and it took me like, I'm so bad at home auditions, but they're terrible. I just set up my lights and, <laughs> and, uh, you know, get my phone and it's like, duh, 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 I'm trying to figure it out. And I do, I probably do 40 t- takes. 40 I t- takes. I, I went from like 8.30 in the morning when I started and then my manager's calling me at like 3.30, like, where is it? It needs to be in. Like, they want it by five. And I'm like, it's coming. I'm, it's almost ready. I almost have a good one. Because it was such a long Mike Flanagan speech. Oh, my god. And gosh. I didn't want to make any mistakes. I've talked about these Flanagan speeches with other actors that have worked with him. They're they're, they're not long. easy. They do one. He likes one or two takes. Yeah. Oh, and it's just pushing in on you. And we're yeah. not cutting away. So it was um, really nerve wracking. I didn't know that about Mike when I had the monologue, I just thought, oh, they've chosen a monologue for the audition. And when they do that, there's just really no way to make a mistake. And you have like 20 beats, you know, you're trying to get out in this monologue. And if you miss one, and I'm like, nope, got to do it again. And so sit, like 40 takes and you got the one that you said. This finally, is I just like, this one's it. It was like 315. And, you know, you upload it, you get it there. And then the next day, they're like, great, they loved it. Okay, you know. They're going to give you a contract tonight. And and then I saw that it was for the series, you know, seven episodes. Were you, you just know? jumping around the house screaming? I was jumping around the house screaming. And I could not believe it. I couldn't believe that my life had taken such a wonderful turn, you know, because I had been kind of in like this funk, like, what am I going to do with myself? And um, 
Well, you know, someone still sees it. You know, I, I mean, someone still sees it. Someone who's a great, he's brilliant. I will say Mike is brilliant. And a lot of people will agree. And for him to say, yep, I, I see her and then her read, you know, you still got it. I hope, I mean, I yeah, really, obviously. I worked, I worked so hard on that show because there were lots of monologues and I am, you know, of a certain age where memorizing is not as easy as it was when I was 20. So my, um, my daughter who lived in Vancouver at the time, I, I had her come over. I hired her every day to go over my lines and we went, you know, I would work really, really hard on them so that when I got to the set that day, I knew I would do it on the first take. I would never, I would never expect them to have to do a second take for me. And so I, I really wanted to bring that and, you know, working with such young actors too, I just wanted to set a really good example.